Well, I don't know about you, but I feel good. Amen. Feels good to be in the presence of God together. Amen. So we were in Galatians chapter 5, and if you have your Bible, I want to turn to a couple of passages, and, and I want to be sensitive to the time right now, but I want us to be able to receive the word of the Lord and, and to grow and to ask God to change these things in our lives. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about having a culture that's focusing on the, the fruit of the Spirit. And that God wants a culture where we're focusing on our character, not our gifts. Our identities in Christ and who we are in Him, not in what we do. Amen. Amen. We talked about, I mean, this is even like true of parenting, isn't it? When you're parenting your child... You don't want to emphasize over and over again and, and, and affirm just their performance or their gifting. That's a setup for failure. Amen. That's going to find their identity in that. And then all of a sudden now they have to keep performing in order to get approval. Amen. When we love them unconditionally, then they find their identity in that rather than who they are than what they do. Amen. And that's the same kind of atmosphere and culture that God wants to be in, in His church. And so that's what we've been looking at, of, of looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, again, we talked about this before. Jesus says, He didn't say, the world's going to know you're my disciples by the signs and the wonders. He says, they're going to know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so we want to make sure we are emphasizing what God wants us to emphasize. And that we are walking in truth as well as in spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're, we're going to cover the next three fruit of the spirit. And I want to, I want to um, draw attention to those right now. So the next one, we've already gone over love, joy, and peace. The next one is patience. Now in the Greek, this is mac, macrothemia. Which means macros is long. And then themia, we've talked about this before, about how it means... A passion, it can even mean anger. And so, in English we say um, short-tempered. And that's really what patience is in the Greek. If it would be translated directly in English with that understanding, it would be long-tempered. That's really what it means. And so it's, it, it, it means that the strong says this. It avoids the, use, the premature use of force or retribution that rises out of improper anger or personal reaction. So it's this understanding that I, I hold back my emotions and I keep them in check in, in the proper way. And not, it's not something out of my own personal offense or reaction, but it is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now we see this first in who our God is. I want to read Romans 2 where this word, macrothemy, is used. But we know that the judgment of God, Romans 2 says, is according to truth against those who practice such things. Listen to the context of how this word is used. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and macrothemia, his long-suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. So, you know, we use that, we hear that verse, God's goodness leads us to repentance. That's true. The context here, though, is his goodness is manifested that he's withholding his wrath. That's the context here. I'm, I'm showing patience. I'm showing, I'm holding this back because I want you to come to me. But the reality is, is that God will never compromise His holiness or His justice. Amen. And so unless we look to His salvation through the blood of Christ, then the deception of the enemy is, you've just got, you know, just keep on living in sin you're, you're all right. Nothing's really happened to you over these last one or five years. And the Bible says, no, that's deception because actually the wrath of God is being stored up. So the revelation is, it's like, it's like behind a dam. The water's rising. If you don't repent, one day that dam is breaking and all that wrath will be poured upon you. And so that's why we need to know 
that God is long-suffering that He might lead us to repentance. Can I get an amen? amen. So there's three, there's three things I want to say about patience. Number one, we need to take responsibility to be patient. That we're not to have excuses. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It said, Paul says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. We talked about this whole word of sanctification, that a lot of times in the church, all you hear is positional sanctification. That is, we are holy through Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. To the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's positional. This is who you are, and this is how God sees you. But then there is the progressive sanctification, where Paul says, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, macrothemia, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Friend, we are responsible to put on patience. We can't make excuses. Now some of us here have personalities that there's more of propensity in this area than others. That's a reality. And I will be the first one to raise my hand on this. I am responsible, you are responsible to put on long suffering. It doesn't just happen. It is a volitional choice. So let's take responsibility. I am responsible to be patient. I am responsible to show patience in this situation. Number two, concerning patience. It is seen over and over again in Proverbs in connection to wisdom. In dealing with relationships or situations. Let me read some Proverbs to you. This is all connected to this understanding of long-suffering. Proverbs 14, 17. He who is soon angry acts foolishly. And a man of wicked plots is hated. Proverbs 14, 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. That's patience. That's that long suffering. But he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. Proverbs 15, 18. A wrathful man serves up fighting, but one slow to anger calms fighting. There it is again. That's that long suffering. Proverbs 16.32 He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Proverbs 19.11 This is a powerful one. The judgment of a man puts off his anger and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Proverbs 25.8 Do not go forth quickly to fight lest you, you know not what to do in the end of it. When your neighbor has put you to shame. This is the wisdom that God wants us to have concerning and applying a patience to our lives. Proverbs 25.15 In being slow to anger, a ruler is won over, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. And finally, Proverbs 29.22 An angry man stirs up fighting, and a furious man abounds in sin. I found this is also connected to our culture. We in the West and America are an impatient people. We create an environment of impatience and time is of the essence. But in that process, we set ourselves up to be impatient and to begin to be moving in anger. I have learned from my time in Africa and my time with the Native Americans that the priority is relationships, not time. And when you have that attitude, you begin to relate to people differently and you begin to talk people in a different manner and you have patience. And you recognize, as the Africans and the Native Americans that I saw, you recognize that they have a long vision, a long view of everything. So if I'm impatient, but I mess up my relationship, what is that in the long haul? Now I've broken relationship with a brother or a sister and all for what? So that I can get this thing that I'm impatient about done. And, it, and you see the value, is, it, there, there is no comparison. And so there, there's this constant long-term view. Will my impatience impede my relationship with this person in the future? And what you find out, friend, is that eventually down the line, 
you might need that person and you've offended them. And the Bible says that it's very difficult to go back an offended brother. Now we know in the body of Christ we're not to be offended, we're to forgive. But the reality is, is that forgiveness is unconditional, but trust is conditional. And you have to build trust up. And if you're breaking it, no, you have some problems. We want a reputation of patience. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, the third one is this. Patience, I believe, biblically is connected to waiting on the Lord. So we, we talk about patience with relating to each other, but there's this vertical component that really changes everything. When I'm waiting on the Lord, it will impact my ability to be patient with people around me. You guys know the verse, Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they will mount up with wings like eagles. I believe that's significant. I know that's your experience and that's mine. When I wait upon the Lord, there's a lifting up by the grace of God in the Spirit that you see a different vantage point, a different perspective on the situation. And now, it's not just me responding and reacting to what I see, but I have the view of God and it changes how I relate to that situation. And I can have patience. Because God's showing me through His eyes. Psalm 37 says the same thing. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Listen to the context. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. That is the antithesis, of course, of this macrothomia. How? Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. That's the response to this situation of the anger that you're feeling. Wait on the Lord. God is going to sort it out. It says it again in Psalm 59, 9. I will wait, O you, I will wait for you, O you, his strength, or my strength. This waiting on the Lord is connected to allowing God to be God. We are so wanting to change matters instantly with our own hands. And you don't allow the Lord to work through the situation. To touch the heart. The reality is friend, none of us in this room can change one another's hearts. Only the Lord can do that. So that's why it says in Proverbs 20, Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord and He will save you. Isaiah 30 says the same thing in verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that He may be gracious to you, and therefore He will be exalted that He may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for Him. That's the understanding. God, you're in control. You're on your throne. Help me to be patient in the situation. You know what's going on. Number two, kindness. Christostis in the Greek. This is, I don't know if you knew this, but the word Christos means to be useful. So I have our dear friends from Minnesota in the back, Tim and Anna, the, same, the famous saying, Minnesota nice. Listen, nice is good, but that's not kindness. You can be nice, we can be nice, and never lift a finger to help anybody. I mean, people know what I'm talking about. This is a big issue in the culture. You find out who your friends are. You find out who's your family when things get rough. If they just say, I'm sorry. Or they get their hands dirty with you. A brother is born out of adversity. You know, this understanding of nice is not the same as biblical kindness. Everybody can be nice to each other. Even in the church setting, of course. How you doing? I, but no one even knows what's going on in each other's lives. Right. Yeah. And we're not even moving to a place of action, which is the root understanding of the word kindness. That's what you're saying. This is the root of it. This is what the, the, the strong says. Refers to meeting real needs in God's way in His timing. Ephesians chapter 2, we see it first, of course, in, with our Lord. That he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness 
toward us in Christ Jesus. Christostis. He would show us this. This is the constant reflection of the scriptures. We are able to show kindness because we have received kindness from our Father. This is how it works. Freely you have received, freely you give. We are able to show kindness to others because, friend, we were enemies of God. And He showed kindness to us. This is the understanding of kindness. How can we show this kindness to people that don't deserve it? Because we talked about this already. The fruit of the Spirit in context, in the Scriptures, is connected to this, this understanding of no strings attached. The world can love. The world can show a joy, a, a peace, but it cannot, and it, it is not the same as the power of the Holy Spirit showing us love to our enemies, being joyful in all circumstance, and having peace in the midst of a storm. And that's what it is here with kindness. I'm able to show kindness to those who don't deserve it, or maybe that I'm not in close friendship with, but it's because it's Christ in me. We can show this kindness because we have been shown this kindness by our Lord and our Savior, and because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Hallelujah. He fills us. We are, this whole context of this passage that we've been talking about, this, this series is, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Continuously. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And how am I filled? How am I showing that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? By the power of God enabling me to be kind. I saw this in Chicago, just in simple ways. I remember we were always we were on the streets doing homeless ministry. I told you some of the testimony of how God provided uh, through um, the Bible Answer Man at Moody Radio, Don Cole. I don't remember Don Cole, but he was the he was the original Bible Answer Man, and 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 God just he just saw my wife as his daughter. In fact, she put he put my wife's picture in his wall and prayed for him like it was his own daughter. And, and, and he came up and we had this opportunity to be on Moody Radio and all that. All this money comes in. We're all in the streets and God's sending money. And then all of a sudden, God, I went to the Burger King to get the money to buy a, a ton of burgers. I don't know, they probably were getting weary of me coming in there getting so many burgers at one time. But when they heard what I was doing, they began to give even more burgers than I was giving them money. Even the people in Burger King are getting touched by God. But I was so, it was so powerful as we would go on the streets with like... 60 or 70 burgers, and I will never forget going across some homeless guys and saying, hey man, here, this is for you in the name of Jesus, and just begin to talk to him. And he would, I, I remember people, some of them saying, no, I'm okay. Give it to this guy over here. He needs it more than I do. Wow. I mean, come on. Wow. That is, that's kindness. That you are not even thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about somebody else who you know, you know is hungry, and you're directing that resource to them. Instead of just taking it upon yourself. That's biblical kindness. I mean, even animals know when, when you're kind to an animal, it reciprocates. It, it, kindness is contagious. Amen. When you show kindness to someone, it's amazing how people feel that compulsion or that desire to show kindness to somebody else. Let me tell you something else too. Kindness can produce a legacy. It's amazing. I, I look back even... I don't even remember him fully, but there was a man named Arthur Hines who came into my dad's life when my dad first came to the Lord and was like a father figure to my dad. And he took on me as a seven-year-old kid or a six-year-old kid and began to show kindness to me and to my family. It changed my dad and it changed, therefore, my life. One man showing kindness. Friend, I'm, it's amazing how a little act of kindness can leave such an impression that that person will never forget it for the rest of their lives. So, I want to give it a couple opportunities so we can show kindness, usefulness, an opportunity to serve. Number one is October 26. How many remember the packathon that we did? Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? October 26th, they're coming here back again. Every meal is 28 cents. So if you could save up your change, 
Last time they came, you guys packed 10,000 plus meals to go to the Middle East among those that are suffering for Christ. I told uh, Feed the Hunger, I'm believing for double or triple that this time. And so let's believe God for this opportunity to show kindness. The second opportunity is, uh, I I want you to come up to Brother Morris. July 13th, we're going to just go and we're going to manicure this lawn over in Sugar Creek. If you want to be a part of that, come and see him or Denise, and he'll give you the information for that opportunity. But friends, let's look as the Holy Spirit leads us for opportunities to show that our faith is real. Not just in word, as John said. We just went through 1 John. But in love and in, in, in deed and action. Amen. Lastly, goodness. Agatha Sine comes from the, the, the base word agathos. The Agatha Sine is actually, there's only four times it's even used in the Bible. And there's no indication of it being used in ancient Greek literature. It's very interesting. But the base word, agathos, is, is, um, was used. As, it, and so I want to read the, the four passages that this word goodness is used. It's used in Romans 15, 14. Paul says, I myself am confident concerning you, my brother, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to also admonish one another. It's used, of course, in Galatians 5.22, and it's used in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11, speaking of God's goodness, to fulfill all good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But listen to this, the last way it's used, I believe it's revelatory to the base understanding of the Greek word. It's in the context of Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 11. Goodness. Paul says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. The word, the good, the word of goodness in the Greek, it carries an understanding of virtue, of moral excellence. And you see how it's used in that shame? That's the connection, that's the context. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. This is the same base word that's used when Jesus says, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit, and a good, and a good tree can't produce that. That's the context. It's, the goodness is this understanding of how you live your life. Not just being good to somebody. You are intrinsically living in a way that is honoring to God and is, and is pure and right in the eyes of God. This is the same word that's used in Mark chapter 10. When the, 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 the rich ruler comes up to Jesus, good teacher. And Jesus says, who's good? That's the context. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. This goodness that comes from God through us. It's also the same word that's used when it, Jesus says, in the last days he will say, well done. Good and faithful servant." Enter into your rest. Now, I'll say this in in closing of this section. You've also maybe heard of it used in the context of generosity. And yes, contextually it can be used that way as well. And and where would you find that is in Matthew chapter 20. That's the story of the master who goes out and calls for workers to work in his vineyard. You know that story. And some he chooses early in the morning, and some are hanging around all day. And he calls them, and he gives them each the same wage, and the people complain. They say, why? And he says, why are you questioning whether I'm good? So that context clearly is, there's an aspect that it can be seen in a sense of generosity. But what I see overall, though, it is connected to righteousness. 
And I, I just believe, friend, as I want to pray this into our lives, even tonight, this goodness. You know when someone's walking in goodness. It brings a comfort, but it can also bring a conviction. You, you know when you're around someone who's walking in goodness. There's a morality, there's, a, there's an excellence of the way they carry themselves. There's a purity. And it brings a safety too, doesn't it? You guys know what that's like. You get around someone that's good, you feel safe around them. This is, this is my memory of my grandfather. This is where I get my height from. He was, he was about 6'6". He served on the USS Daniel in the Second World War. And my grandpa Brown, my mom's side, my mom's dad, he was a good man. Whenever you got around, Grandpa, you felt safe. You felt the purity and the, and the, the, the reality this man walked without guile. And there was just a comfort that came when you came around him. And you can see that with children. Children are drawn to goodness. They can sense when someone is of a good spirit. And that's how we are to live our lives all around us. That people come near us and they sense this is a, this is a, a man or a woman of moral excellence. And they, they know it because it's the Lord in your life. So I want to... Um, I want us, if, where you are, would you stand with me? I want us to pray these things into our lives right now. Let's agree together. Even right where you are, would you... Begin to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. That His patience... His long suffering, his long temperament would fill you. Would, you. would you be reminded tonight that this patience is our responsibility? It's time to stop making excuses. If you need to repent right now, repent before the Lord. Friend, this is a cultural phenomenon. And it's, it's creating an atmosphere that's explosive. And we as the children of God are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Would you ask the Lord right now to take full responsibility to exhibit patience? And would you prioritize relationships over your schedule? I remember even in Africa, his eyes closed, just talk to the Lord. I just want to, it's coming into my mind. Because I believe that this is how the rest of the world operates, but we in the West have really lost this. So I was just talking to a man, and I was on a schedule. I had, I had a list, a to-do list, in the streets of Dakar, Senegal. And as I passed by, he stopped me, and, and I, my flesh was saying, I just want to get this done. i got so much to do today. But the Spirit, praise the Lord, when we allow the Spirit to fill us, he can override the flesh. And I began to talk and be patient with this man. And after whatever 20 minutes of time that went by, that was a lot of time that I needed to get things done, he turned to me and he says, you are different than other Americans. Other Americans, they always say time is money. They don't have time to talk, but you have taken time to talk to me. And it opened the door for the gospel. Lord, we pray Free us from the influence of our culture. And let us be countercultural by the power of the fruit of the Spirit. Help us, O oh God, as a people to wait upon you, to get a heavenly perspective, and to allow you to be God, and to move, to not be impetuous, to not be a Saul, but to be like David, and to allow you to guide and to lead us, rather than to act out of the arm of the flesh. Father, help us as a body of believers. Lord, to be patient in the way, Lord God, that we are trusting in you to have your way in this situation. Father, fill us. Fill us with your kindness. Let us not just be nice people, but let us be people that act and show our kindness by action and meeting practical needs. And showing, Lord God, that we're more than talk. 
And Father, lastly, we pray, God, fill us with your goodness. Let us, Lord, walk in this goodness that comes only by the power of the Holy Spirit, especially in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation that's filled and glorifies iniquity and sin. But God, as we walk in holiness, let it, Lord God, shine on the darkness, exposing what is hidden, that they would see what it is in the light of your countenance, that there will be repentance and a coming to the place of the only true refuge. And that is in the name of Jesus and the truth of who he is and saving us from the kingdom of darkness, from the evil one. Have your way with us right now.